All right, good. Uh, happy to start. Paul uh, Valiant will tell us today about how to get uh, more rather than less, I guess, of your data. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but Next so week, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, just try to take the mask off. Uh, I think, yeah, no, maybe. I, I'm not sure. Maybe you're not allowed. Maybe it's okay, yeah? Okay, yeah? Okay. It's okay. I mean, we are protected here. I think everybody's happy with it. Yeah, it's okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, I'm out of practice giving Blackboard talks, um, but hopefully we'll get through this. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about two papers, um, one of which will appear in uh, NeurIPS this week. The other is on the archive as of last week, but nowhere else. Um, and both of them, them are very much ongoing topics. Um, so uh, I'd love to talk about any other stuff. Um, like there's a lot of open research directions. Um, so I'll start with um, so, 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 so two results, very different flavors. So I guess I'll try and make use of the break halfway through to uh, change topics. Um, so that clock works, it's just 10 minutes fast. No, 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 it doesn't work at all. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to figure out if it's a constant yeah, yeah, function or a linear function for 10 off there. Okay, okay. You'll have lots of time when yeah. making it. <laughs> yep. Um, so, um, the first result I'm talking about tries to be kind of the last paper in that area trying to resolve things. So it doesn't leave as much open. Um, the second paper I'll talk about tries to be the first paper in the area trying to create create a new model, um, trying to spawn new work. So we'll see if we can get that, you know, we'll see if I can try to encourage any interest in this. Um, and um, so some common themes are, uh, um, so, you know, taking some data and trying to do some, I think, new and fundamental things with what seems like some very classic fundamental problems. Um, so um, some themes are uh, convex optimization duality. Um, also just personally, I really like to work on both the algorithmic and lower band side of things because the impossibility results kind of shed light on the landscape of what might be possible. And if you kind of keep the impossible stuff at your back, then you keep a much better sense of where to head. Um, and, um, yeah, I kind of like finding the right algorithm, and if you really have a good eye on the lower bands, that, that helps you uh, helps you do that. Um, okay, so the, the the other weird theme that I realize that these two these two works have is they're both about estimating the mean of a distribution. You have a distribution, you get data from it, you want to compute its mean. The same is trivial, um, but yeah, the two entirely different results that um, I want to tell you about. So okay, um, the first one. Um, so um, your first question is going to be like, surely we knew how to do this before, but but no. Um, so you've got n n values from a real value distribution, and you want to estimate the mean of the distribution. Okay. Um, there's a few problem formulation aspects here. Um, so. Um, Um, okay, so what's the right way to even ask this question? So uh, you get a sample of capital X, um, X1 to Xn. You've got n samples from some distribution. Um, so each of these are in uh, real numbers, or you know, n, n tuples real numbers if you want me to talk about it like that. Um, and uh, we want to estimate the mean. So um, we're, we're going to come up with a uh, um, mu hat, hat means estimator, um, given the sample x. Um, 
and these are from a distribution D of new, on the real numbers. Again, this is crucial. Sorry, I forgot to say that. Um, so we've got mu hat based on a sample. We want to compare it with mu based on the true distribution. Again, you know, um, using mu hat for an estimator that we do in terms of the data that we have, and mu just the mean function based on the actual distribution. Um, so I think the most natural setting, sorry, as a computer scientist, the most natural setting I think is the uh, pack setting. So um, we want to say, look, um, there's some error. Um, and I want to understand when I can get the error to be, say, less than some bad epsilon um, with, say, the probability of this being at least minus other parameter delta. Okay? So we, um, this is parameterized by epsilon and delta. Um, where delta is often called the, uh, I I'm writing super big here, which I guess is good for the zoom audience. Um, but yeah, um, so we call this a delta sorry, robust estimator. Since so estimator is delta robust if it fails with probability delta. Okay, so we want to understand when can we produce delta robust estimators of the mean. Okay, so, so this is basic. Um, okay, so. Of course, the obvious thing to try is the sample mean. You have some data, let's take the mean of it. Um, so, um, okay, um, how does that do? Okay, so sample mean. Um, so this is, uh, F is one over F, sorry, one over N. Um, of, uh, um, so, first thing I want to say is that sample mean has many nice properties. It works great for all sorts of different scenarios. It's robust to a lot of modeling issues. Like if your if your samples from your distribution aren't independent, then you know more sophisticated algorithms. Who knows what they'll do? But the sample mean will kind of gracefully degrade if the assumptions that involve them are like a, a bit weird. This is minor, but did you want to mention the end? Uh, the vector of n samples is an out of the n. Yeah, so, so my sample in individually is a real number. X i is an out. So d is a distribution in the real number. Yeah. Um, okay, so, sorry, so, so there's been a lot of excitement in the computer science field and also statistics lately for trying to um, get versions of this in the high dimensional case. Um, but the one dimensional case is still not solved. Today. Um, no, 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 okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about the previous work here. Um, and then, the, you know, the question is whether this style result can also extend to the high dimensional case, which is actually something I'm actually working on. Um, but yeah, so in one dimension, this problem remains open. So, so, so again, I'm trying to convince you this is actually a basic problem. It's a problem that you would have assumed someone would, would know the answer to, right? Um, like there's no, nothing weird about the setup here. Right? I mean, the only slightly weird thing is. You know, it's epsilon delta dependence, but you know, it, it's, I think, natural way to ask this question. Um, okay, so the sample mean, um, yes, yeah, so, so again, you had n samples in one dimension, and it's not the dimension. Um, so, um, like one thing that you often ask um, when you're doing statistics is how does this work for Gaussians? Gaussians are the best behaved distribution ever, so the sample mean, how does this work in the ideal case? Um, great benchmark to have. So, um, okay, there's a bunch of ways you can ask this question. Um, I'll change the way in just a moment, but for the moment, um, supposing we're aiming for this, we can say that um, for Gaussian, how many samples do you need so that such that the sample mean will attain this relation, will be delta robust and given give accuracy epsilon. Um, and um, or Gaussian, um, you need n equals um, two plus little o of one. So this is you know a very much uh, tight characterization. Um, so how, okay, how many samples do you need to estimate the mean? Um, can you guys actually help me out here? How many samples? So, so we want to estimate the mean to within epsilon. Um, from a Gaussian. So how many samples do you need if you just take the sample, sample mean? Hmm? 
Hmm? Log one over epsilon. Um, so, so if you average together n samples, how much does the accuracy decrease as a function of n? How, how much does the error decrease if you average together n ID samples? What do you have to say? Hmm? One over square root n. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we, the number of samples should be proportional to one over epsilon squared. Um, so I can say one over epsilon squared. Um, and okay, so there's two more terms, one of which is kind of didn't mention, but so it needs to be here. The S, sorry, that's a very bad thing. sigma. Um, the standard deviation of the Gaussian. Yeah, so if the Gaussian is bigger, then of course the error is going to be bigger. Um, and then there's some dependence on delta, where because we're in a computer science planet at the moment, um, it's going to depend on the log of delta. Okay. So it's a two that you were right? This is a two? Yeah, I'm just asking. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so, so um, this, is, this is the expression. Um, this, so, so, sorry. There's no, sorry, there's no square root here. No square root. Um, just a log of samples. Okay, so, so this is the number of samples you need for the Gaussian case. Um, it's got everything you would expect. Um, so the scaling factor, just because the scale of the error. But just to be clear, the question is given epsilon and delta, what n should we? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes. So to, to, this is our goal. Um, this is our goal. What, what do we need? Okay. Um, so um, yeah, two is exactly the right constant. You can dribble lower bands. Um, I can dribble lower bands if you really want. Um, but um, you know, so since it's a Gaussian, the sample means for Gaussian. Not not so surprised. Um, by the way, the way that I want to rephrase this is um, um, yeah. So, so, so just reparameterizing. So, so you know, L, epsilon, delta, and n are all kind of you know things that you know or care about. Um, so you can reparameterize things instead of saying what n is needed to obtain an epsilon and delta. You can uh, phrase it in other ways. So the way we'll phrase it is what error epsilon do you get if you have n samples and you insist on delta robustness? Okay, so I'm just solving this relation for uh, epsilon, I guess, pulling epsilon out. So um, different way of saying this is that with probability one minus delta, um, the uh, estimate true mean but the distribution is equal to and th this is an expression that, that we'll stick with for a while um, so there is some uh, one plus little o of one term times um, okay, the variance times the square root of uh, two log of the delta over Okay, so, so again, this is a slightly annoying expression, but it's the truth for Gaussians, okay? Um, and, you know, n, delta, the variance all show up and nothing else really shows up, there's a two, okay? Um, okay, so again, this is uh, the sample mean. So, so, oh, yeah. so this would be now n and delta are fixed and this gives you the estimate of epsilon. Yes, yes. Yes. Um, okay, so. Um, so that value comes from this expression? The, sorry. So the value of the minus that could square root of the expression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sigma, the case should be square root of the other. Yeah. Sorry. Sigma squared, yeah. Thank you. Um, so yeah. It's going to be important. The delta will be important to you. Uh, to me. Um, so, 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 so. No, I'm just wondering because we can amplify by the distance, uh, paying the log one of the delta, sure. whatever number um, we are using. So, you, the, 
you know, it's important for you. You want to keep it rather than deciding it's uh, you know one tenth for now. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, uh, uh, okay. So, so you know, you, you could say that I'm being too particular. I'm trying to get an, an analysis that's too accurate, but. Um, no, it's okay. I'm just checking that. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. You want so that your... delta is the, the big thing I care about. So okay. this will be tight. What I'll tell you will be tight in the asymptotic regime. So in, in the regime where delta is little over one. Um, so for delta equals one over ten, it has already been resolved or something. Um, no, I mean for delta equals one over ten. This is sorry. Um, okay, sorry, sorry. Let me tell you the main result. Okay, this is I think a useful time time to tell you this. Um, so, so okay, um, as set up. We said, you know, what's the easiest case to talk about? Just the sample mean is the easiest algorithm to talk about. The Gaussian is kind of the most standard case to talk about. So, in the most standard case, how, what's the performance? And this is the performance where this is kind of the best case performance, right? So, Gaussian is kind of the best case. And the best case for Gaussian is the sample mean is provably optimal. So, this is the best case. Um, what about for an arbitrary distribution? And the result is that actually, um, for any D, um, that's any D, this is true where mu hat is no longer um, the sample mean, but it's the algorithm that I'll tell you about. Okay, so we've got an algorithm that performs as well for any distribution as the sample mean does for the best distribution. Okay, so. We thought the Gaussian was the best case, it turns out Gaussian is the worst case. Any distribution could do at least as well as the Gaussian. And again, um, yes, we care about the log delta. We even care about the two, you know, it's, this is tied up to a little over one. So for constant range of delta, yeah, this might not quite be super constant tight, but it will become very tight. So you really want to say for any D that exists a new hat, or, or you, you have a new hat that works for all of these. You have an estimate of an estimate or something. Yeah, so you want to probably say it like that or something. Because new hat is not what new hat was before. Uh, of course, nobody sees this. So uh, only the two center balls you can put them up and down. So sorry, sorry, is, is that kind of center? No, no, no. Just leave just it and make another uh, one. Okay. Um, and then you can so I won't write anything here other than you had something, and I'll fill this in later. Okay, it's, it's going to be filled in. Okay, it's a specific you had. Okay. Um, okay. So. Um, okay. Before I do that, I just wanted to briefly um, say, explain that the sample mean fails and explain a little bit slightly more complicated things in the sample mean and you know, fill you in on the last 50 years of work. You know? um, okay, so. Um, in the bottom board, you cannot know this up and down. Sure. So it will be covered. Um, oh, I see. How, how many boards do I have here? So you just have two. So <laughs> okay. you just have two that go up and down. Okay, so fine. Forgive me, but I'll <laughs> um, So, okay. Um, sample mean is not, not good. Okay, so, I just want to present a short example of sample mean failing. Um, and, okay, yeah. Um, okay, so I'm not sure what the easiest way to just define a distribution is, but. Um, let D um, be uh, supported on uh, zero and one. And so this is, you know, a Bernoulli. What's his name? A Bernoulli distribution. And I just need to tell you what the probability of one is. And the point is when the probability of one is something very small, then the sample mean is not very robust. Um, so, wait, well, let me just do that in calculation because maybe it'll help. So, um, uh, to, yeah, so if, uh, the, so, so yeah, if, if P is just the probability of one, just standard uh, Bernoulli notation. So if P is, um, let's see, delta over N, so I think this will cause problems. So, um, 
if we take n samples from, distri from distribution, um, then right, the thing of delta is being very small. So the probability of, draw of drawing a one is actually a lot smaller than one over n. So if you draw n samples, you probably won't even see a single one. You'll probably see entirely zeros. Okay, but with probably roughly delta, if you draw n samples, you will see one value of one. Okay. Um, so if we're talking about the uh, delta unlikeliness regime, like things that could happen with probability delta, then we could actually see a one. Okay. Um, so um, if we see a one. Um, so, so, so the, the true mean is very close to zero, but if we see a one, the sample mean will be one over n because one out of our n samples is one. Um, so um, with probability roughly delta, um, we will see one, one, um, and then uh, sample mean is uh, 1 over n, sorry, roughly 1 over n, um, because the true mean is really close to 0. Um, and so okay, we got an error of roughly 1 over n. What should our error be according to this formula? Um, okay, so, so this is like a 1 plus a little 1 term. Um, this is, okay, mixed, um, as opposed to um, instead of So 2 log 1 over delta over n. Um, the variance of the distribution, um, the variance of this Bernoulli distribution is just, um, it's uh, like thank you. p times 1 minus p, which in this case is very, very close to just p. OK? So um, the uh, square root of the variance is roughly, uh, Yeah, just p, which is delta over n. Okay, so this thing there's a um, root n in the bottom twice. So this is uh, one over n, and then square root of delta times two log one over delta. Um, and the point being that we. Um, wanted the sample error to decay essentially with the square root of delta, but instead the sample error doesn't decay at all. Okay, so um, in other words, we uh, um, phrase differently. Um, if you normalize everything in, in this thing, um, instead of a, uh, um, I think I'm probably saying this wrong, but something like instead of a logarithmic delta dependence here, um, the sample mean has a root delta dependence here, like one over root delta dependence here. So it's polynomial delta dependence instead of a logarithmic delta dependence, which is a lot worse than it should be. So the sample mean just doesn't behave robustly at all. It but doesn't you, have the exponential is, convergence. But this is at the, at the set that you exclude, at the bad set, the probability delta. Oh, so, sorry. So, so instead of making this have probability delta, make it have probability 1.1 delta so that you can't exclude, exclude it. Okay. So as in, with probably greater than delta, this bad thing will happen. So this is not a delta robust estimator because with probably greater than delta, this bad thing will happen. Why does it happen with probability greater than delta? Um, if I make this uh, one, one delta, then that's now greater than delta. Oh, okay. Yeah. Is, is this the worst guess or can you prove that and this kind of Um, I think it was the worst it gets, yeah. Um, but uh, okay, so here, let, let me jump forward from prehistory to um, modern computer science stuff um, and give you a simple estimator that actually is constant factor optimal. So it gets a constant of like instead of two, instead of square root of two, it's like square root of 16 or something. Um, and this is the classic median of means estimator. Okay. Um, so I'm sure most of you have seen this in. Various different forms, but um, just want to point out that this is really nice. It's uh, really robust, um, and uh, you know, it's simple. It's got simple analysis, and it's constant vector type. Um, 
So um, let me just analyze this via diagram. Um, okay, so median of um, okay, so let me, yeah, let me just draw a diagram. Just, yeah, I, I don't feel like doing computations on the board right now. Um, so you, you've got some data x1 all the way up to xn, and you do the following. You divide it into groups. Um, say each group is of size k. This shouldn't be big lines. Um, each group is of size k. It says k elements here, k elements here, etc. You take the uh, mean of each group. And you return the median of all the means. So, um, okay. why why is this super robust? So, um, okay. So, so what happens here? Um, so, the mean. The, the sample mean of each individual thing. Um, well, I guess as, as we sort of saw here, the sample mean performs okay for the uh, constant delta regime. It's exponentially worse as a function of delta, but for constant delta, it's kind of okay. So um, you can use Chebyshev's inequality to just say that, you know, except with some constant probability, each of these things won't be more than a constant number of standard deviations away from where it should be, away from its true mean. Um, and so, so each of these things has some constant probability of um, this mean of this k things being wrong. But then the median automatically makes this exponentially robust in the sense that, um, so if we consider any one, sorry, if for each one of these sets, we consider the event of it being off by more than this constant number of standard, devi standard deviations from its mean, then, uh, the median will be too high if more than half of these means are off, right? So if each mean, say, is off with probability at most a quarter, then the probability that more than a half of them will be off is exponentially small. And that's the proof. So that's a standard simplification. That's what, what I, why I asked in the beginning whether you care about optimality in delta because that's a constant. Yep. Yep. This is a Yep. That's how we amplify delta if you want. Yes. Um, so, yeah, this, um, you um, divide this into some constant times log k group. This is a constant times log delta groups. So k is like n over log delta. And yeah, this, this will give you that for a constant. It's not the best constant, but it's a constant. Okay. Um, so I guess one thing I want to say is that, um, you know, do we care about constants here? And it sort of depends what context you're looking at this in. But um, if you're dealing with real data, then constants often do matter because, you know, for many data-driven companies these days, data is the most expensive or most valuable thing to have. And, um, you know, if they're a billion dollar company, they've got a billion dollars worth of data. And I tell them that, you know, I can, whatever task they want to do with the data, I can do it in half the amount of data that they thought they needed. Then this suddenly makes them effectively a $2 billion company. So you know, if data is the valuable commodity, then saving a factor of two on data is like saving a factor of two on money. Um, you know, the, the, like constant factors have sort of gone by the wayside with uh, um, computational cost or memory or whatever, because we've gotten used to computers getting faster and memory getting bigger. But you know, in many contexts, data is you know a big limitation and it's got a fixed cost. Um, so okay, um, let me just say that um, recently, that in um, statistics journals, there've been people that have actually been chasing after this result, and um, so uh, the state of the art is this paper by uh, Catoni in two thousand twelve that. Um, does this if you know the variance, um, which is a little bit unrealistic. So, you know. In particular, 
it means that you're you're only looking at distribution that has variance. Um, oh, oh, oh yeah, I'm only looking at distribution that has variance because the variance of the distribution is a key appears in the equation here. Oh, so so it's not the any distribution. Um, well, if, if the variance is infinite, then my pen will be infinite, and uh, oops, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, but um, so, so, you know, if, if we're worried about distributions with heavy tails, then, uh, and, you know, we're trying to compute the, the mean, then it's a little bit weird to assume that we don't know what the mean is, but we really know what the variance is. Um, different way of saying this is that, well, you can actually try the different problem of, of estimating the variance. How many samples does it take to estimate the variance? Well, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, for the mean, you kind of need to know the, uh, so, sorry, um, to estimate the mean well, you need the second moment to be bounded. To estimate the second moment, the variance well, you need the fourth moment to be bounded. So the previous state of the art essentially assumed that the fourth moment is bounded. Um, but that's not really the most, you know, heavy tail distributions you could, you could imagine. Um, as in, you know, you, 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 you were worried about even assuming that the variance exists, so you should be very worried if you're assuming the fourth moments exist. Yeah, of course. Um, okay, so um, sorry. Um, the um, other thing, of course, I'm sorry, I keep forgetting to do this kind of stuff. Um, I teach, of course, I this is a result with my PhD student, Jasper Lee, um, who is very much looking for a postdoc right now. Um, so yes, I should mention that. Um, I've mentioned both him and that he's looking at something. Um, anyway, so, okay. Um, let me... Um, let me tell you about my estimate. Okay, so yeah, great. Um, okay. Um, Okay, so trying to find the right estimator. Um, there's many different things to try. Um, as it turns out, one kind of barrier to a lot of this stuff is that if you come up with a fantastic but complicated estimator, then you've got kind of no chance of analyzing it tight enough to prove this kind of result. So, you know, many kind of complicated problems to proceed, you can come up with some bounds for, but if you actually want to bound up to, you know, little over one constants, then this sort of limits what you can do. Um, but I like trying to come up with simple algorithms because if you transform, oh, sorry, at least at IS, I think I can quote Einstein saying it'll make everything as simple as possible, but no simpler. So, you know, if you try and find the right algorithm and you try and simplify it, then you're probably making progress in other senses. Um, also, I, um, sort of, we should have a multi dimensional version that's on our mind because if we really get the right intuition from a single dimensional version, then this might help us with the multi-dimensional version. Whereas if we find an almost but not quite right intuition for one-dimensional version, I think it'll generally be better. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to iteratively find this out, and I'll start out with a very sketchy thing and make it a bit more precise. Um, so, um, okay, the algorithm is the following, and I'll fill in some more stuff on the board. Um, so, go oh, out. Um, uh, Third log one over delta, um, most extreme. And third mean of what remains. Um, okay, so as a first step, this is the same thought. So throw out outliers. Okay. Um, so, what do you mean by most extreme? Like, most extreme from what? Um, so, wait, fine. So, there's a preliminary pre process step. Um, so, uh, maybe you, you shift to zero um, some rough estimate. And rough estimate, like maybe the median of mean step. Get some rough estimate, recenter it, and then 
we now have got notion of outliers of most extreme elements. Um, but this double the list are the most, oh, you want to know how many from the left, how many from the right. That's the uh, important thing. I mean, the extreme elements would be the largest or the smallest, right? It's a really um, But do you prefer the largest or the smallest? Yeah, that's what I'm asking. So that you sample it yeah. so that you know how many from the right and how many yeah. from the left. Yeah. Um, but it'll be from one side. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. So we're actually, we won't just throw things out. We'll throw things out in a weighted manner. So it'll be a bit more delicate. Um, so throw out a weighted manner. Um, so as in, you can throw out a third of the sample, a tenth of that sample, et cetera. Um, and one of the weights. Um, the uh, weight I throw out from x um, being equal to um, let's say alpha of x squared. Um, so this is after the weight. This x is after the weight. The weight of x. What, what do you call x now? This is some, sorry, so, so first, first we recenter. Yeah. So now we call the, x. And then forget that. Yeah. Forget the recentering. So, um, what used to be the median, the mean is now zero. Yeah. And now, um, you know, things with big value of x squared are far from the center. Yeah, I'm just asking whether what you call x now is a sample after recentering. After recentering. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, after recentering. Yes. Um, so, throw things out proportionally to the square of how far they are from the mean. This is like from, from, from the origin. Okay. Um, and how do you pick alpha? Well, you pick alpha so that you end up throwing out as many samples total. Okay. Um, but okay, if you just do this naively, you could end up throwing out more than an entire sample. Like you've got one sample out here, I want to throw out two of it. But I only have one of it. How do I throw out two of it if I only have one of it? Yeah. So, um, you know, one. Okay. And this is the final. So you just you, you just manually make the variance uh, smaller than one. Um, this isn't quite the variance. If you center and then they get squared, it's a variance. That, that's um. So this is the fraction of each element that I'm throwing out. Um. So let me view the the algorithm in a different form. Um. I, this makes sense to me, but if it doesn't make sense to you, let me rewrite this in equations. Um, so uh, this algorithm is defined by two equalities. Yeah, but uh, well, yeah. I guess the question is not that yeah, it's, it's clear, but it's, it's, it's clear to me also. But you want to say uh, precisely when you say uh, you saw it with weights, what you mean is that you have a holistic aspect of and right, and uh, um, every element. No. Okay, so, so, so yeah, there's two, two, two big things. Yeah, let me rewrite the equation. Um, so, um, first condition is that we're going to throw out um, a third order delta weight. So, um, we throw out this much weight from sample x. So, the sum over all i, i, all samples i of um, the amount we throw out from sample i, the min of alpha times i squared, this thing is going to be the log of the delta. Okay, first condition. Second thing is what's our final estimated thing we actually return? This is equal to um, the sample mean after we throw out this amount of weight from the corresponding elements. So let me write this equation down to avoid confusion. The sample mean, whatever n times the sum of overall times i of, um, if you just want the sample mean, it would be this, but I'm downweighting each. Each sample sometimes, so that instead of counting all of it, I may count only 90% of it. This is essentially rounding it towards zero. So um, instead of counting it once, I'm taking it once minus the amount that we throw out from it. Once minus the uh, alpha where it comes from. Okay, this is the algorithm in two equations. There's a third step, which is recenter at the uh, median of means, but then do these two equations. 
Um, center and then do this. This is like the different, this is the update to the median of means. Yeah. Oh. Yes. This is the update to the median of means. Thank you. So alpha is a parameter that helps you throw out exactly a third log delta of the elements. Um, so, so, so I guess, okay, um, one way of looking at this is if you get rid of this common one with min with one, which is a little bit weird, then alpha is essentially a proxy for the um, sample variance. So, um, if we get rid of the one, then this is just alpha xi squared equals some constant. So that means that um, uh, one over alpha equals uh, one over log delta, delta times the uh, sample variance. Yeah, if the if the min with one never plots. Yeah. So you should think of alpha as being a proxy to the sample variance. How hard is it to compute alpha? Great, great question. Uh, linear time. Um, a statistician would not ask that question, but in this room, this is completely fair game. Um, yeah, so um, th this isn't any slower than computing the uh, um, sample mean. Um, so this is a monotonic function of alpha. Um, so um, for one thing, you can do a kind of n log n algorithm with just a binary search for the value of alpha. It's monotonic n piecewise linear. So it's only effectively n breakpoints, so it's n log n. Um, but you can be a bit more clever. And if you're aware of how to find medians in linear time, um, the median is also a monotonic piecewise. This is, so, sorry. Um, you can phrase the median also as an implicit problem where you're optimizing it. This is, sorry, where you're solving a monotonic piecewise linear equation of trying to find the place where half the points are below and half the points are above. So um, if instead of trying to use the standard linear time median algorithm to find the place where half points are below and half points are above, Instead, try to solve this condition for alpha, same thing works as linear time again. But it's rather easy to also get an n log n time algorithm, which is fine in practice. Okay. okay. Can you explain again how, which one now you solve, now that you have these weights, but the weights sum up to one over. Right. So, so for each element xi, um, this expression, this min of alpha xi squared on one tells you what fashion that particular element for x. You just reduce this number, right? You either, either remove it completely outside x squared bigger than one, right? In which case, you remove it to solve it away. Otherwise, you just make it smaller by a factor of the data, maybe one in the middle, and a few data further out. Um, so we're going to throw data out proportionally to the square of the the origin. Um, so um, you know, suppose we decide we want to throw out um, you know, three pieces of data, then maybe we end up throwing out you know, almost all of this one, maybe you know, a third of this one because like you know, this is close to the origin. And you know, also like a third of each of these things, that kind of thing. Yeah, when you store a third of it, right. it means that you give it a smaller weight in there, right? Yes. And it's, when you throw out a third of this element, you multiply it by two thirds. You're shifting it towards zero, where zero is where we're resetting everything. Okay. So throwing out is just an expression. What you're actually doing is just giving it a lower weight. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. The sample mean would be a weighted mean. I want to ask you again about alpha. I, didn't, I still don't understand exactly what, 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 you know, what it is in the general. It's a trust formula. Well, not really. It's a definition of alpha. Yeah, this, this is the definition of alpha. Yeah. Okay, so say again how you can keep it. Um, so, yes, yeah, so, so the left hand side, okay, so, sorry, this first equation is the definition of alpha. The left hand side is a piecewise linear monotonic function, monotonically increasing function of alpha. 
So you can do a binary search for f, for values of alpha. And specifically, um, the only n, sorry, if you're worried about like. These are linear terms. So yeah. Um, that a bit more work. Yeah. yeah. I just was wondering if there's a trade off between calling samples maybe in higher dimensions. Yeah, yeah. So it's in higher dimensions. Any, anything could happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, so, by the way, in higher dimensions, um, the uh, analogous result to this, um, so the best thing known has, con has a constant here. The last paper I looked at had uh, like 320,000 as a constant here. Um, so in high dimensions, we're, we're not here yet. Um, I probably shouldn't be talking about this if this is being broadcast, but I've got an idea of how to get this algorithm to work in high dimensions, which might actually be tight, but the analysis is scary at the moment. Um, yeah, so, so no, no, no guarantees whether that will work out. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so mostly what I want to talk about for the next few minutes is just how to analyze this kind of weird algorithm. Um, but I, okay, I want to spend a few more minutes just giving you into an intuition about it because, yeah, it's a bit weird. Okay. Can I ask a question? Can you hear yes. me? Yes, I can. I'm surprised by that. I can hear you. Yes. Uh, can you please explain the one third? What, what is the role of this number? Okay, yeah. Um, perfect. Um, yeah, so, so before I talk about proofs, um, or just proof techniques, um, yeah, I should motivate a little bit about what's going on here. Um, so, um, let me get to your question in just a moment. Uh, there's one other quick thing I was planning on saying. Um, so alpha is sort of like um, the empirical variance um, if this min with one term never happens. So as in, you know, um, you'll throw out an increasing fraction of each element until you some, suddenly, like if you have an element way out here, you'll just throw out all of it and not, you know, more than one of it. Um, so, so, so if this one thing never shows up, then alpha really does have a formula in terms of the empirical variance. Um, and, um, you know, if you just get, get rid of the mean common one, this is just a xi minus alpha times xi squared thing. Sorry, xi minus alpha times xi cubed, rather. So the sum of xi cubed is the empirical third moment. So I might be missing some constant here, but this is you know, in the case that the min with one never has an effect, this is the um, empirical um, mean, the empirical first moment um, minus a third log one over delta times the empirical uh, third moment over the empirical second moment. Okay, so, so this is a good, you know, slightly weird expression, but you know, it's not super surprising if I write it this way. So we're correcting the empirical mean by subtracting a third log, log of whatever delta times the empirical third moment over the, over the empirical second moment. Why, why over the second? You have the x squared, the x uh, cubed? That's the third? Um, yeah, and alpha, is, alpha the, uh, is one over the empirical second. Oh, alpha is the, OK, yeah, yeah, OK, thank you. OK, um, yeah, so anyway. Um, Going back to the question, um, so let me explain the one third log delta from at least one perspective. Um, so if you want to write from this or on the other board? You want to draw the other board? Um, uh, uh, yeah, the, okay. uh, I, I think it's okay. Um, so, um, okay, I just want to draw a diagram and not say too much about it. But um, so when you're trying to construct algorithms for problems, you try to keep in mind what, what's the kind of most extreme case that that you know, might be archetypal of the kind of things that can go wrong or of the you know, case that really stress your algorithm. Um, so for this problem, I think actually Bernoulli distributions are among the most stressful things. It's of course hard to prove that any distribution behaves exactly like a Bernoulli because distributions can be more complicated than Bernoulli's. But um, if, if we get it right on Bernoulli's, we're in good shape. So if we get it right on Bernoulli's and we've got an elegant algorithm, I think we're in good shape. Um, so let me tell you about Bernoulli's and why the one third log delta drops out of Bernoulli's. If you look at things in exactly the right way. 
Um, so, um, okay, let's look at a Bernoulli distribution. Um, but a uh, very biased Bernoulli distribution where the probability of getting one is tiny. Um, very biased, very biased. Um, so if it's very biased, then, um, yeah, I just want to draw pictures here, not proving anything. Um, just trying to give some intuition about the third law delta. Um, the number of times you see a one becomes essentially a Poisson distribution. The number of ones, um, sorry, Bernoulli of, uh, um, sorry, Bernoulli of parameters n and p. Okay, so n samples with probably p. So the number of ones is roughly like the Poisson distribution of parameter n times p. Okay. Um, and let me draw a picture of um, the uh, log probability, the uh, log probability mass function of just a Poisson. Okay. Um, so of course it looks like a Gaussian. Everything looks, looks like a Gaussian. Um, namely, this is just a negative quadratic function if you take the log of Gaussian. Um, so, um, okay. Actually, if it looked exactly like a Gaussian, then the sample mean would be exactly the right thing to do. You wouldn't need to change anything. Um, but I'm not sure what the scale is. Like, you're not going to think about p less than one over n. Um, sorry, sorry. So um, we're fixing n times p. And this axis is, is a number of ones that, we, that are observed from this. And this is the log probability of seeing that many ones. Okay. Um, so um, the sample mean is just proportional to the number of ones that you get. Um, so this axis you can also think of being the sample mean. Um, and one, I guess one way of saying this is, um, suppose that someone gives you delta. So this is the robustness parameter that the robustness budget that we have to work with. And we can kind of draw it down here. So if we draw the um, uh, delta intercept, log, log delta, um, then we can be anywhere above this region in the uh, um, in this diagram. So we can draw any number of samples that's between here and here. Yep. Um, so um, this is very uh, symmetric. So you know, if log delta is say delta is closer to one, then you know things will be nice and centered like this. And the claim is all right. I'm going to make the following weird claim. If you look super close at this log of a Poisson, then uh, actually. If you intersect it with this line down at delta, log delta, these intersection points won't be symmetric, will not be symmetric around NP. There's a skew to the Poisson. Um, will they be shifted outwards, shifted leftwards, shifted rightwards? Like, you know, who knows, right? Well, actually, it turns out they'll be shifted rightwards. How will they be shifted rightwards? Can anyone guess based on this pattern matching? Uh, a third log delta. So it's as if both of these endpoints will end up being shifted a little bit from what would be the symmetric arrangement. Um, so basically, a Poisson behaves like a Gaussian, except if you intersect it with this line log delta down, the intersection points will be roughly shifted to first order by um, a third log one over delta. So this is the explanation, at least for the Poisson, why you need to subtract um, a third log delta, or you know, essentially, if you get um, this many ones, these ones are the extreme samples. So how many of them do you throw out? You throw out a third log delta of them, essentially shifting the sample to the left by a third log, log delta ones. And yeah, this is the only thing that works. So for, for the Poisson case, it's the only thing that works. To get it to, to work in general, you, uh, you, um, you add this alpha parameter and you know, throwing these out in a weighted manner. But yeah, so for the Poisson, it's the only thing that works. Um, okay, let's see. So I want to take a break soon and also talk about a completely different topic. 
not going to do it, I promise. But um, so I guess the one thing which I wanted to tell you about here a little bit was one analysis technique that um, in retrospect feels really obvious. I hope it'll feel nice and obvious to you guys once we're all on the same page. But um, we were sort of stuck at this position for about a year. Um, we're just like, you know, yeah, you can analyze this algorithm, but you can't analyze it tight. Like analyzing it super tightly is just hard. Um, so, so, so again, like the kind of thing that we would want to do is a churn off bound, for example. So churn off bounds um, work extremely well if you've got sums of independent variables, and then everything just becomes exponential, and churn off bounds in many cases are extremely tight. Um, but the issue is that we're effectively, um, so, so like the first moment, the empirical mean is the sum of independent things, great. The third moment is the sum of independent things, great. But once you divide the third moment by the second moment, it's no longer the sum of independent things. And therefore, you don't have independence, and it's a lot harder to argue. Um, we, we tried stuff like, you know, what if instead of the empirical second moment, you divide by the true second moment? Can we show that that algorithm works, and then show that the empirical second moment is close enough in the case of that matter? But actually, if you change this to the true second moment, the algorithm doesn't work. It's not tight enough. Um, I guess one way to think about this is that um, in cases where you um, so say like this really extreme Poisson, the third moment and the second moment will be, sorry, the empirical third, third moment and the empirical second moment will, will be rather correlated with each other. So if you get a lot more samples out here, then both the empirical third moment and the empirical second moment will be big. So um, this term um, isn't as badly behaved as the third moment alone because the case that the third moment are badly behaved is kind of canceled out a little bit, mitigated by the second moment, divided by the second moment. Um, so, so you, you really sort of need to you know, analyze this ratio in total instead of analyzing the top and bottom separately. Yeah. Um, OK, so let me try to just say something very brief about why this algorithm, sorry, how, how to analyze this algorithm. Um, I want to just, yeah, I want to keep this very clean. Um, so, um, so one way of saying this is that the only issue here is alpha. So, you know, everything in these two equations is super linear in samples. Sorry, linear in samples. I'm using super as a Californian, not as a math term. <laughs> um, um, so, um, you know, if we sort of got alpha out of the picture, this would be great. Um, so, um, if, can I ask another question? Yes. yes. Sorry. Uh, maybe it's two questions. One is, can you think about this third as coming from the integral of x squared in the third moment as the integral? Like, is there some way to interpret this? Yeah, exactly, yes. So if you take the third order power expansion of a lot of things like e to the x or log x, there's a third order term that's you know a third or a sixth, which is essentially a third up to factor two. Um, uh -huh. So um, yeah, that's an um, essentially equivalent way of, of looking at where, where this comes from, yeah. Um, and, and you know, if you just write out the uh, expression for Poisson, and try and you know understand where this thing is coming from. Then yeah, you might have third order power expansion of this, and yeah, the third order term of the power expansion is where this thing comes from. Yeah. And a related question is: if you do minus a fifth with the fifth moment and the fourth moment, you will get a better answer. Um. So so okay. Oh yeah, I don't know. This is, so this is optimal in the sense that it's you know little over one tight. Um, I'd be very worried about changing anything about it because it'll probably, um, I, I mean, I guess maybe you're asking, can you get higher order tightness in some sense? But um, unless you are very careful about how, how the setup works, you'd probably lose lower, lower order tightness before you gain higher order tightness. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I, I mean, this is extremely delicate. Like. Um, once you actually get to the analysis, there are these inequalities where if you plot them, and it's like some two-dimensional function where like two functions really hug each other in some really complicated way over some entire you know two-dimensional landscape. So you know, I think there's something non-trivial here. And if you're trying to do something better, then 
it, it will be complicated. Um, but it, yeah, I, I haven't thought about that. Um, as I said, like um, when you mention this result in public, the first question you always get is, what's the higher dimensional case? Um, so that's, I think, the more natural place to look next. But uh, yeah, I'm sure there's many other problems related to this. Um, OK, so, so I just wanted to, let's see. Um, I wanted to cleanly state something about um, how to analyze this. Um, okay. Yeah. Let me just try doing this very um, kind of on, on the on the blackboard. Um, so we've got two conditions. Let me make them. Um, Equations that should equal zero. So let's call this um, the psi of alpha, just a function of uh, everything here, equals um, this thing. And I'm going to subtract this. So notion being that psi of alpha should be zero. Okay. And let's call this psi of mu, meaning just the condition for mu. Um, so I'm going to just call that. Okay, so um, these um, my algorithm is now expressed as this vector value function you know, in two dimensions, where we want this vector to equal zero. Okay, and um, the point is, so, so, sorry, so this is a two dimensional function. It linearly maps all the samples independently. Uh, so, sorry, it's a, it's a IID sum of functions of separate independent draws for the distribution. Um, with also, of course, independence on alpha and mu. So this is a function of alpha, mu, and a bunch of samples from distribution, but it's a very much linear and independent um, sum of uh, functions of the values of the distribution. Okay. Um, so um, essentially, um, oh, sorry. What, what does it look like when our algorithm goes wrong? Um, suppose our algorithm fails. Um, what does that look like? Well, um, that means that there's some particular uh, alpha, some some particular mu hat, such that these things are both zero with high enough probability that an aggregate is screwed up over. Um, so to uh, analyze the algorithm, we essentially want to rule out any of the failure modes. So for each and every alpha mu hat pair, Let's show that um, the algorithm will fail with small probability. Okay. Um, so this is a um, two-dimensional vector that's a um, IID sum of um, n draws from the distribution. Um, we just want to show that for a particular alpha and mu, it's not going to be the vector value zero. Okay. Um, so um, If we draw this in size space, um, how do we show that with high probability we're not zero? Well, as I mentioned earlier, it's sort of the only trick in the book that's you know flexible and tight in a ton of different cases is turnoff bounds. So to show that this thing is not zero, I'm going to just um, pick a half space and show that with high probability it's so a half space that doesn't include zero and show that it's here. Okay. So how do you do that? But with, with turnoff bounds, namely, you um, pick a vector in this direction and analyze the uh, expectation. Um, let's see. Um, um, yeah. Um, expectation that, uh, so that's our expectation of e to the, um, so I'm going to call this vector d, just. Um, so e to the d times that dot product of the psi. Um, so, so analyze this expectation and um, then uh, sorry, uh, blanking on exactly the algebra, but you know, this is very transparent and the same as just the probability that is this how you can convert this to the band on the probability that uh, sorry, should I think of order? So you know you want to figure out the probability. That uh, um, x, so, sorry, that 
psi is not equal to zero. And this is essentially less than or equal to this expectation um, where you get to pick the value of D. Okay, it's entirely up to you to pick the value of D. Um, psi is a uh, linear, uh, linear function of all of the samples. Um, so this expectation is actually equal to the um, nth power of what's happening for an individual sample. Um, sorry, sample x, sorry, capital X from like d to the n, or if you just take a sample little x from d of the same thing, to the n, um, and uh, Psi, you know, this dot product is literally, literally just the dot product of this thing with some fixed vector d. Um, so it's all linear. Um, and right, let me just have one, one more very brief um, high level thing, which will also show up in the next part of the talk. Um, so, um, um, we want to find the Um, best bound for this. Um, so um, one way of saying this is that um, we're worried about the max over all distributions d of whatever bound happens. Yeah, we're worried about this. We want to understand. We want to bound the worst case of all distributions d. Um, but we still get to pick the uh, direction little d. Okay. This is our turn-off bound parameter. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I kind of lost you. I'm not sure why aren't we checking all possible mu and alpha. We are, we are. We, we'll, so we'll need to take a union bound over some discrete metric that later, yes. So that's to make sure we're, we, we, we have a sample of Excel and we want to make sure that psi alpha psi mu, which is, a, which is now a random function on two variables, alpha and mu, is not a zero function. Yep. But we also don't want it to have any region of zero. Yep, yep, if yep. We, in yeah. fact, we only wanted to have one zero. That's, we, we would like it to, to be a function that has only one zero. Right. Um, so so in, in particular, we want to show that for any mu hat that's more than epsilon far from the true mu, there won't be a zero there, except with probability delta. Yeah. You're, so you're, you're looking at, 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 the thick, at some width around mu, around the real mu, and for any alpha? Yeah. Um, sorry, everything outside of that width in mu. So, okay, so, so we want to rule out things going wrong. Yeah. So like two half spaces. Yep. Yep. Two half spaces yep. of every alpha. Yep. All the mu's outside of that region. Yep. You want to say that there are no zeros here. Right. So okay. I'll tell you about how to analyze it for a particular mu and alpha. You'll need to take a union bound of some discrete mesh and use some monotonicity and Lipschitz properties. That's not so interesting, but yeah. Oh, no, just to, to Yeah. 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 Fair question. Yes. But the um, point you're making now is that the little d can be chosen as a function of the big d that is given. You get to pick d, little d, um, to optimize the turnoff there. Yeah. So d can depend on the distribution d as well as uh, mu and alpha. Okay. Um, great. Um, okay. So, 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 okay. Avi is trying to optimize things and really get the best little d. Um, yeah. I thought that's the plane, but we're working. Um, we're working in. No, the expectation just keeps the answer for you. So, so, so oh, yeah. fixing the mu and alpha, we want to show that this particular mu and alpha is not going to fail. Namely, psi is zero with only tiny probability for this given mu and alpha. Um, okay, so. Um, yeah, I just want to make two very high level quick comments. Um, so the first thing is that um, as it turns out, we can swap the order of the min and the max. So um, this is von Neumann's minimax theorem, um, which relies on it being convex in one variable and concave. This function needs to be convex in one variable and concave in the other variable. Um, and um, we, we actually only need to look at the exponent and only the exponent for a single draw from the distribution, just because we've already simplified it for that case. So looking at 
just the exponent for a single drop in this distribution. It's convex in one of these and concave in the others. So we can swap them in at the max. Okay. Swapping them in at the max, um, min over little d, max over big d. This actually um, refutes Avi's point. So uh, we don't need to worry about picking little d dependent on big d. We can pick a universal little d that works for all big d, which makes our life so much easier. So Bonhomme's minimax theorem says that we don't need to make our life complicated in this way. The last thing I want to say is that um, if you just look at the exponent, um, d times this, which is now we're treating this as a function of a single sample x, um, and d with half of alpha, um, where again, we're taking logs because this whole thing is monotonic in the log of, in its log, sorry, log is monotonic. Um, also, nth power is monotonic. Um, this is now a linear in um, the uh, distribution tree that's kind of a probability vector. Um, so we can actually take the dual of the inner linear linear program. The inner optimization is now linear. Um, so we can take the dual here. And um, this now makes it, um, instead of maximizing over all infinite dimensional distribution D, we're just, um, the only variables we have correspond to the constraints of the original thing, and the constraints are, um, um, I think, sorry, okay, I didn't mention this at all, but maybe, maybe mean zero and variance one kind of thing. Um, so, oh, and total probability mass one. So you'll end up with just three variables in the linear equation here if you take the dual. Um, so we use Lamont's minimax theorem and then do dual to get min of a min. What's the dual? What's linear programming duality? Oh. Oh. In the space of these, what? Oh, this, sorry, in capital or lowercase? Uh, capital. Capital, yes. In distributions. Capital. Yeah. yeah. Distributions of, say, unit variance. Yeah. How? But you're, when you're, yeah. say it again, why the dual is so much simpler? Why don't you just Um, Because the constraints in the final become variables in the dual. And what is it again? The constraint. The constraints are just the mean. Yeah, mean one total probability mass one and variance. That's like mean zero total probability mass one and I think variance one by this point. I haven't mentioned that, but yeah. Um, so so throw, okay, let me rephrase this in a, in a different. Um, sorry, in the paper we had three variables, but I'm, yeah, maybe if you split it, that's like you get two variables. Um, so. Think of this as being two or three variables. A punchline I want to say out of this is that um, um, this means that the most extremal distribution D in this setting has support two or three, depending on which case we're looking at. So, as in these Bernoulli distributions or a distribution support in three points, literally is the most extreme thing. So, at least if you're using this analysis technique, then all you need to do is worry about. Um, Bernoulli's essentially. And if you can prove it for Bernoulli's under this analysis technique, then it's true for everything. So this is the sign of why I take the dual actually really simplifies our life. So instead of having to analyze all distributions, we really only need to analyze all distributions for that two points, point three. So it's not, yes, you're saying that this analysis would work for any uh, estimator that has this property that is linear in the space of samples. Uh, it does not yeah. write whatever you whatever it yeah, so, so, so statisticians call this a psi estimator, psi, okay? Um, where, um, again, you rephrase it, you rephrase the estimator as being an implicit function. Um, so statisticians only do this with one variable, one variable implicit estimator. This is a two variable implicit estimator, which adds you know, more issues. But um, yeah, so, so this is the technique that I wanted to tell you about. Um, so you've got some really complicated process, but you, if you can rephrase it as an implicit function, with some small number of parameters. In this case, alpha is the only mysterious parameter, but alpha and mu are the two parameters. It's an implicit function. Then suddenly everything becomes extremely linear, but has this implicit representation. But the linearity means that you can do turnoff bounds. And yeah, you, you still pay some price for the implicit representation. In this case, the union bound over all the mu's and alphas. But you know, turnoff bounds means that you, you can at least get start, start and get something really tight for that. So that's what I wanted to say about this. Any questions? We should take a break.
question, question from the Zoom audience. Okay, so let's take a five minute break. Uh, is the flow of the linear problem something that you can explain in a, in a minute, or is it uh, uh, something you may have seen it? You may, you may have heard I'm one of the organ in the whole general. I'm one of the, I know. Yeah, it's a very special case. So I'm one of the, you know, that you know the now problem is right. If you have, a, you have a system of uh, linear inequality and you want to know when it is not, that's the that, that, that kind of. There's like right. a particular mean for every. Yeah, oh, um, sorry. Um, D will still depend on U and alpha. Can you actually write it down as a function? Yes. Um, it involves some of the weird square groups that I found via combination of math. But it's like an algebraic function. Yes. Um, yes. But it, so, like, take advantage. We've got some yeah, weird yeah. high-dimensional phenomena that you know, yeah. is unlikely to be near near, near zero, and we're trying well, to. Uh, you uh, play, you don't want uh, to play, you can play. We're hoping that the reason it stays far from zero is that it actually stays on one side of the hyperplane. Yeah, um, uh, so you know, this yeah, technique yeah. isn't always going to work, for, but you know, you're trying to find some set of hyperplane, uh, sorry, some set of uh, you know half space so, so yes, you know, that. Um, um, yeah, so, um, sure, the trauma bands are great, but if you're trying to do a trauma band like conjunction, it's like I'm trying to band the probability that both the alpha coordinate psi and the mu coordinate psi are zero. Yeah. Then, like, you know, um, think about how it looks. I mean, it's a little bit weirder, but like picking these half spaces is the only thing I know how to do. If there's no solution, then there's a complex combination of the equation that. Shows you the contradiction. If you have any ideas for any other possible <laughs> choices, this kind of thing, then I'm, I really the am. Right. Yeah. The linear is very easy. The linear thing is very easy. But that's, that's how it is. That's yeah, yes, yes. Um, but, but just like trying to analyze the conjunction of two things, that it's um, trying to you know, say, find the probability that it's zero in right. two dimensions. Uh, like somehow. Uh, I mean, now we have one of the. You are just complex combination, just new. Yes, just about that, but it would have to be missing the point a little bit. Yeah, so it's like, I said, like, well, you know, that's it. But I don't say that. Correct, yeah, I would say, what I call the Mishpani, I mean, I would say, what I call the Mishpani. So, so did, just to mention some goofy things that come up on that. So if I've been trying to analyze this high dimensional thing, I think I've got an algorithm that I think it might work, but like way far away from doing it. But um, so uh, the kind of questions that I'm starting to look at are um, we've got some arbitrary distribution of one dimension, one dimension, and um, what's the probability? Find some probability on the conjunction of following two things. The empirical mean is far off, but the empirical variance is low. Um, so, 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 so say this again, supposing you've got distribution of mean zero and variance one. Okay. And supposing you know that, well, this is what I'm um, what's the probability that the empirical mean is off by like more than log delta times square root of it? But over square root of it, or whatever the reasonable thing is. But also um, that the uh, um, empirical covariance is at most three. The, the, the true variance is one. Um, but you know, can you rule out um, the empirical mean being far off while the empirical variance is not you know, is off? Um, like, yes, yeah, so, 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 so some of these conjunctions, it's like the internal balance or get, look a lot more with it. Yeah, this is, uh, yeah, it's, it's really nice. Uh, Let me see what I'm talking about next. It's really nice. You rarely see uses of uh, of uh, what I call minimax or the 
you know, complex, complicated case. There is the same bit only in the linear case. Oh, game theory, right? Well, um, in the next half hour, you'll see it again. Good. How can you show that something is convex or concave with respect to all possible distributions? Um, a linear function is trivially convex and, and concave, both. Yep. And um, no, but it's with respect to. Um, I, I, I guess you should show that something is uh, is it, it has a certain behavior with respect to D. Yeah, to, so, so I'm forgetting exactly where everything comes from, but it's um, strictly linear in one variable and um, linear in the exponent in the other variable. So an exponential function of, of any affine function is convex. The linear function is concave because it's yeah, affine. It's linear. Yeah. But it's but it's not linear in D. It's linear in the in the sample that you chose from D. Oh um no, so, so, so at this point we're looking at an expectation. So there's no samples. Um the um yeah, I guess so I guess I missed a step here. Um so uh The expectation just for a single draw from this of this thing is really just um, um, if you let d sub x be the um, probability of drawing x, it's just the sum over all x of d sub x times this thing, yeah. e to the d. Ah, I see what you mean. Okay, and now it's uh, raises to the end just because this raises to the end. Oh, yeah, and it's uh, it's linear in d sub x. Linear in d sub x and exponential in uh, d. Yeah. Little d. Yeah, I see. So it's uh, okay. So that's, that's like the because of the, the expectation value is a linear is linear in d in big d. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that's, uh, mm -hmm. that's, uh, yep. 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 So, uh, yeah. Okay. Let me just uh, find my place. So, you know if Ricky is coming? I would. I would think so. I went to the restaurant. Okay. I need yeah. to appear. Okay. Yes, yeah, so Give me a minute. Just to myself. Talking about um, because this is a big context switch. Um. I'm not sure. We'll start somewhere. I'll tell you some cool stuff, and uh, we'll end somewhere on time. Okay. Um, okay. So um, I want to talk about a new model for um, statist statistical estimation. Um, so um, okay. I think instead of uh, trying to be too philosophical, let me just try to write any model as quickly as possible. Um, so, um, at a high level, um, huge amounts of statistics are based on some sort of assumption about the distribution that your data comes from. Um, whether it's you know Gaussian or you know IID samples or things like that. Um, and recently, a variant of this has become very trendy: robust, robust statistics, where um, instead of assuming all of your data comes from this distribution, you assume that like 80% of it comes from a distribution, or you know, one minus some epsilon fraction comes from a distribution. Um, so this is still a distributional assumption about where your data is coming from. It's just a distributional assumption on a portion of the data. Um, but instead, today I want to look, I want to make no assumptions about the distribution of the data, but instead look at the sampling process, how you obtain the data. Um, because in many situations, you have a lot more control or understanding of how you got the data as opposed to actually what the data is. Um, so, you know, if you're doing political polls, I don't know what people think, but I know what I did to get the data. Um, 
So, uh -huh. Trying to think um, how to uh, uh, okay, so um, consider um. N entities, I'm going to label them uh, one through N. Think of it as people. Each of them has some unknown real value data value that we can ask about. Um, each of them has X1 up to Xn. Um, so, um, and for the moment, um, think of them as being bounded. Um, so, like a, in a political poll, it's a yes no question. Or say between plus or minus one, um, this kind of thing. So, um, and uh, the goal is to estimate the, uh, the mean, um, of the mean of uh, one dot dot. Yeah. I'll generalize this a bit. Um, so um, what, what we what we receive is a sample set S. Um, so there's a distribution uh, D. Um, do I want to call it D or I want to call it P? Um, that probably doesn't appear much. Um, we call it P. Um, so a distribution P from which you get a entire sample set S. So S is a subset of one through N. Okay. Um, so um, there's some process by which you get data. And we want to scrutinize this process and get the most that we can from understanding this process. In the case that you get a IID sample from the distribution, um, where you know everyone's uniformly sampled, IID uniform sample for the distribution, there's nothing to do. But in many cases it's not uniform, not IID. Um, so, 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 sorry. Um, yes, so, so again, we're assuming there's a distribution P on subsets of S, and we're trying to do what we can with this. Okay. Um, so, the game is that um, we receive the following. Um, so, we get a sample of data from the people in S. Okay. So, we're told who we've got data from, and we're told if you'll excuse this notation, x sub s, the data values of the people that you know, we sample. Um, and okay, so, so this is the problem. How well can we do? Um, and uh, the benchmark is um, worst case expected, um, I guess squared error. Um, so um, we don't want to make any assumptions about the data values x1 through xn. We're assuming they're bounded, um, but you know, no distributional assumptions whatsoever. Um, again, bounded just for sanity's sake that you know, if one of them can be infinity, then like, the mean is going to be infinity. You, know, you need to assume something. You can also assume an L2 bound on the data or L1 bound or something, but you know, we're just going to take the infinity norm bound on the data. You need some bound. You um, find everything is uh, equivalent. Yeah. Well, uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So we are assuming. I, I care less about constants in this in this okay. but yeah. Um, okay. So we have uh, the other parameter of the size of S compared to N or something like that. Like S should be of a certain size. Um, so, so that's all determined by P. And we're going to assume that you know P or have sample access to, to P. Or we're going to try and understand the role of P in this process. For which distributions P can you do well at this game? P is a uh, distribution on the subsets of uh, on the power set on N. Yes. Okay. Um, 
So given P, you want to come up with an algorithm, and that's basically the only parameters for this. So given P, you want to come up with an algorithm where no matter what data you get, you'll be able to return a reasonable estimate of what's going on. Let me write that down more technically. Um, actually, um, sorry, well, let me generalize this a tiny bit. I hope this won't confuse you too much. But um, so um, to generalize this, instead of trying to predict the mean of the whole set, um, you can um, actually try and predict the mean on some target set T. So S will be the sample set, T will be the target set. And you now want to predict the mean of X sub T. Okay. Given S, E, and okay, so, so you need sample or T is given. T is sample by P or T is given. Yeah, so this um oh, the distribution is on both. Yeah, so distribution on uh pairs yeah. of sets. Okay. So um when um, um, when it when it comes time to play this game, someone says, "Okay, here's your here's your data. These are the people that we've got data for. Um, here's the people we have data for. Here's the data we got from those people. Please make a prediction about the mean of this other set of people t." Okay, so here's how the game works. And of course, t could always be the the entire set. So you know, the case I, I mentioned five minutes ago is a special case of this, which is also a fair and challenging case, but I'm just generalizing this a tiny bit. Okay. When we're taking the mean, the goal, that's also, T is fixed or we're also, we're in it? So, 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 so this is the process. Um, you get S and T from this distribution. Yeah. Um, then uh, your algorithm receives this stuff. I'm giving you no guarantees whatsoever about the data values x1 through xn, except that they're, say, in uh, um, And then you want to do something with these inputs to return this. And the goal, let me write this down more formally. OK? So um, worst case over the data value, we're making no assumptions about the data. So x1 uh, dot, 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 xn are in minus one, one of uh, the expected squared error. But the expectation is over the randomness of P. Um, so uh, expectation S comma T coming from P of uh, um, so you've got some function F that takes in S, T, and X of S, and we're comparing this to the true mean of X and T. And right, mean squared error. Uh, what am I doing? Sorry. Yeah, squared inside the expectation. Okay. And that mean is really just the average of the value. Of I. Yes, yes, just the average of the values in the targets of T. Okay, so um, you're given some distrib distribution P. Um, we want to understand the role of P in this. Again, there's trivial P for which, you know, say S is um, uniform ID, draw each element, in which case for trying to sample mean is great. Um, but um, the question is kind of when can we do non non trivially better than the trivial, or, you know, than the sample mean or than some obvious approach. Okay. Um, so um, okay. Let me actually give some motivation for this. Average weight estimate, but like the S and T are sampling and put the distribution. There's no assumption about it's both sampled separately from T. No, no. So it's jointly sampled. Can be horrible. They can be correlated in a horrible way. Yes. Yeah. So it can be this job. Yeah. 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 So you don't expect to get that. So this should be compared yeah. to something. So the, yeah. See how they, they, they can be correlated in some horrible way that tells you that what for each S gives you the best T possible, the, the worst T possible. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so, so as one trivial example, um, supposing, um, oh yeah. 
I'm not sure anyone wants to hear about you know politics, political metaphors, but you know, supposing S is um, always a subset of the left half of the room and T is always a subset of the right half of the room, um, then you know one really embarrassing case would be if um, the data values X are picked so that the left half of the room has one data value, the right half of the room has a completely separate data value. And you've got no information about the right half of the room based on the left half of the room. Okay. So in that case, you can't do anything, and you you clearly clearly can't do anything. We're interested in the case that you can do something, but it's not trivial to do something. Okay. Um, so yeah, let me present a couple of examples. Um, so um, um, uh, one example has an important sampling. It shows up in a bunch of different guises. Um, so um, sorry, I'll, I'll just do it in a hand wavy sense, so I can give more details if you want. Um, so um, suppose, just for simplification, um, T is going to be just the entire set. So we're just trying to estimate the mean of, of everyone. Um, and suppose S um, underrepresents certain people, OK? So we're doing a political survey. The left half of the room responds with probability 50%. The right half responds with probability only 10%. How do I get an accurate estimate of the entire average of the room given that the right half under response. Um, and, and we're talking about the case where we actually know P, where we, you know, we're trying to understand what you can do with P. In real life, you may have some partial knowledge of P, which is a great question, but you know, um, we're trying to understand you know, at least what the gamut of options are if you know what P is. So um, in this case, um, one standard solution turns out to be unbiased is if you know the right half of the room response to your survey a fifth as often as the left half, and every time you get a response from the right half, you weight it five times as much in return to the overall weighted mean. Okay, so, so um, because responses from the right half are rare, you can't five times as much to an expectation. Everyone contributes the same amount to the, sur to the survey. Okay, um, so this is one classic example um, with, with a reasonable solution. It's not an optimal solution, it's a reasonable solution. Um, one example where we don't have a reasonable solution, I think I mentioned this in my abstract. Um, so you can imagine some uh, social network graph um, where, um, so, so, so one way that sociologists actually conduct surveys sometimes is um, that they um, find someone in the social network, they give them a survey, and they say, please also recruit your friends and your friends' friends and your friends' friends' friends. Um, so this is used um, for, in cases where um, it's, um, hard to directly sample from the population. So all you can do is maybe find one person, hope that they can find their friends. Um, so drug users or sex workers, just um, you know, examples where there might be a social network, but where sociologists don't have access to a random sample. Um, so um, then you know, maybe S could be um, um, who is reached by, say, you know, um, steps of this viral process. Okay, this have quantities, or right? Sure, or, or whatever, or yeah, yeah, whatever. yeah. Um, so again, like, we're, we're considering all the distributions P here, so this is really everything, right? And I'll give you an algorithm that works for everything, um, up to a pi over two approximation factor, and some other caveats, but, um, um, so S is some weird distribution that depends on the social network. You want to understand the sample, sorry, the, the um, mean of the, the entire population. Um, how can knowing S and knowing the social network, knowing this process P, help you unbias what happens? Um, so this is a, um, so sociologists use this a lot. It's called snowball sampling. And they don't have a good answer for what to do with it. Um, and again, what we're saying is slightly unrealistic in that we're assuming that sociologists know the viral structure uh, know the structure of this viral spread. Um, but, um, you know, the insights about how you would debias this if you knew certain things about, um, about the structure would help design better surveys. And, you, you know, you can proactively design. Um, so you, you can also use our tools to kind of estimate how bad things would be if the social network had this shape. Um, so, yeah, lots of leeway here. Um, one other example, which I think is super cool, but I um, don't want to go into. Um, so um, 
So this work is joint work with my brother, Gregory Valiant, and uh, um, Justin Chen, who is a new PhD student at MIT, was at Stanford with, with Greg. Um, so um, Greg was on a previous paper that um, looked at the following very much special case of this. Um, so this previous paper can be viewed as like, um, oh my god, there's an algorithm here when we you know, didn't even look possible. Um, and this led to this whole question of, you know, what other cases are there when things are possible? So um, um, one example of a particular, very much not uh, um, um, independent structure of the sample of the target um, is when you've got time series data where um, the sample is the past and the target is the future, right? So if I want to predict something about the future, then yeah, the past may not be representative of the future. Of course, you can make distributional assumptions if you assume that um, the data values x1 through xn are, have some properties, then yes, you can make predictions about the future. But to what degree can you make predictions about the future without any distributional assumptions? This, is, this seems flat, flat out impossible, yes? So, so okay, let, let me give the rules of the game a tiny bit more. It'll still seem flat out but impossible, but still. Um, so you're given a sequence of um, so, sorry, I'll phrase this a tiny bit differently from here, but um, it'll turn out to be the same. Um, so, following game. Someone gives you a sequence of numbers. Each day you get a new number. Um, and your abilities are the following. At any, any point you'd say, stop, I have a prediction. And what you're allowed to predict, um, if you had to predict the next day's value, that would clearly be impossible. Um, instead, I'm going to give you one other power. You can say, no, no, I want to predict the next W day, some, some width W, okay? So at any point you can yell stop and you can give a width W and say, I have a prediction about the next W uh, day's data. The mean of the, the mean of the next W day's data, yes. And this as it turns out, you can actually do something non-trivial. Um, the, mean, the mean squared error, instead of being constant trivial is instead one over the log of the number of days. The what? One over the log of the number of days. What? At least reminds me something from about one year ago. This statement. I maybe I am I yeah, before where you and Greg were <laughs> were in business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, something of this nature, predicting uh, the week the W itself it also at the oldest point. You can Yes. Yeah, so that was the I wasn't on this paper, Greg. I, I hope Greg referenced this paper that, that you have in mind. But um, okay, so, so okay, I guess just to tell you what works here. So um, pick the stopping day uniformly without looking at the data. Pick the window width exponentially, so as in a random power of two, and predict that the next W days will have the same average as the previous W days. Okay, so, so this turns out to work, but it's still just really weird. So um, this model you can think of as being a vast generalization of this, trying to ask, you know, when when can this phenomenon apply in general? How does it work? Um, so um, well, work is it the, the mean square error. Uh, mean square going to zero. Yeah, so it would be logarithmic in the yeah, so, so I mean, the, now n days all together. It claims that the mean squared error is something like one over log. Of n if there's n days. Um, sorry, so um okay, to try this out. So um random time is f please. So yeah. what is n? Pick this time. Yes. Okay. And um, the width of the window, which is also going to be the width of the previous data that you're going to use to predict the future, um, W is going to be randomly drawn from one to four, all power of two. So if it is a particular two, it's going to be same. So it's all, I didn't really, sorry, I missed something wrong. The samples of two are the same, just it's further along with this. Um, yeah, but we make no, distrib no distributional assumptions whatsoever about the data at each day. So, so there's no assumption about the xi's at each day i, other than that they're bounded. 
no assumptions. So this is important for the T S and T of this job, and nevertheless you can say something on the job. Yeah, perfect, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, so what can I tell you guys? Uh -huh. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so, so, so have I motivated this? So, um, yes. great, great. So, so there's a few different examples. Um, they've got very different flavor. There is the uh, um, important sampling where you just you know multiply by how much people are underrepresented, which works. It's not the best, but it works. It's great. That's an example of how to use knowledge about the distribution concretely to improve your estimates. Um, this is a different example where it's, it's really weird intuition. Um, the social network thing is an example where previously people had no solution. And yes, yeah, so this all fits in our framework. And let me tell you about what to do with this framework. Okay. Um, and again, I would like to get to uh, some uh, um, minimax theorem, uh, Grodendieck stuff. Um, and yeah, so the, 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 there isn't too much um, to say. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, okay, so this is our goal. Um, so this is, sorry. Um, Need to add one more thing. We want, of course, to minimize with respect to f. We choose the algorithm f. Okay, great. So, so, so this is our goal. We want to understand this optimization problem. So, I mean, okay, of course, this is like um, not anywhere near the form it needs to be, but you can see we already have a minimum x. So, like, you know, okay, we're halfway to uh, getting a uh, minimum x here. It's happening. Um, okay, so. Uh, Um, okay, the first thing is that we're actually not going to look at general algorithm F, but we're going to look at what I'm going to call semi linear algorithms. So, um, otherwise, we won't be able to use that. Right. Um, yeah, so um, let's see. Um, okay, yes. Yeah, so, so um, Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm going to erase things, um, but hopefully not too much. Um, okay, so first rearrangement is instead of um, representing this as being an arbitrary distribution, um, just for the sake of analysis, consider this as being a uniform distribution over a list of options. So consider this distribution T as just being a list of options. Um, so, so SI comma TI is going to be the ith option that the distribution can return. You can approximate any distribution that you know, to any accuracy you want is being uniform over some sufficiently large list. Yeah. Um, so, who's the eraser? Okay, so instead of expectation, um, I'm going to consider this as the sum i1 to m, 1 over m, of um, si ti. Thank you. So I can build a petition like that. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. No, no rules whatsoever about this stuff. Um, okay, so the first big thing, so okay, semi-linear algorithm. Um, so instead of a generic um, thing, so, so um, this F, instead of taking in the entire thing here, we could just consider it taking in just the index I because you know, F could just memorize the distribution. Um, and again, the sample set S. Um, so okay, instead of an arbitrary algorithm here, I'm going to insist that it's got the form an inner product of AI with uh, the sample set. Okay, so exactly which, um, so for each person, there's a coefficient but the coefficients can depend on the entirety of the set S and the set T in any way possible. Okay, so someone says to you, I've got survey data about this people, I want to make a prediction about these people. And then you 
take a look at the people you're, you have data for and the people you're predicting, but not yet looking at the responses that you have, can come up with any set of linear coefficients. Then you make the prediction based on these linear coefficients of the response you actually get from the people in the survey. This is quite general. It encompasses this kind of algorithm and, uh, and uh, um, important sampling and you know, any reasonable thing we know of. Um, I'm, of course, curious whether these algorithms are optimal in some sense of the word. Um, they're not actually optimal. So via some computer search, we managed to find a gap of 1.004 between the best semi-linear algorithm and the best actual best, best algorithm. So there's some gap. But the fact that we only kind of get 1.004 means, you know, maybe it's benign in all cases, but I don't know. Um, and, uh, okay, I mean, just for um, san sanity's sake, so. Um, AI okay. like AI are now matrices, but matrix in a bit. No, it was vectors. AI is a vector of some kind of size. You're saying? Yeah. Oh, that's an inner product. That's yeah, right. okay. yes, inner product. Thank you. I'll put a transport here, yes. Thank yeah. you. Transport. Transport? Yes. Okay. Great. Um, so, oh, uh, okay. Actually, sorry, I'm going to um, change things a tiny bit more. So instead of x sub s, I'm just going to define this with the restriction that um, support, thank you, of ai is a subset of s. Okay. Of si. Great. Um, okay, so now, now things are rather more linear, but still general, but you know, linear. So, okay. Um, sorry, I. There aren't that many transformations I want to do, but they're all a little bit dense. Um, so it's trying to remind myself what's going on here. Um, but for example, this this can't give the new hat from last time. No, it no. was not. Uh, no. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep, yep, yep. So this isn't completely general, but just, um, you know, we're sort of worried about the potentially exponential size of uh, the number of S's and T's you can get. So the fact that this algorithm still can have an exponential number of parameters here means that it's a, it's a big number of algorithms. There's a lot, lot, lot of leeway here. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, yep, 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 yep. Okay, great. So, um, uh, well, let me introduce some more notation. So um, in, instead of writing mean of x of t, um, let me say that um, little t of i is the vector such that um, little t of i dot plotted with x is the mean of x of t. So that's a little t of i just um, one over the size. Yeah, one over the size of t on the indicator uh, of the support. Yeah, um, in support of t. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. So then uh, this formula here um, hopefully becomes simpler. So um, let's see. Max. So now um, the uh, our our algorithms thing is just AI AI minus TI right? right and the sample mean is just TI right. okay yes just what you said AI minus TI X so this is our error and we want to square this okay um. Different way of writing this is just pulling the x outside to make this a uh, quadratic form. Yeah. So um, uh, um, AI minus TI. So this thing, and then just left and right multiply by. Okay. Uh, so the quadratic form is uh, random. Ah, no, it's not random. No, no. Yes, I'm that's, that's what the algorithm does. Fix the AI. 
Yes. We pick the AIs, the TIs are given to us. Yeah. This is, sorry, did I get transcripts wrong? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Great. So um, I guess then the point is that maximizing this thing is the uh, semi definite equivalent deep problem. Um, so. Um, well, not quite. You, you're, you're for, oh, you mean for fixed A, given the, given the A. Sorry. Yes, I missed a step. Um, OK, so we of course want to do this. Um, but this is challenging. So let's just look at the inner maximization problem. Yeah. Even given a fixed algorithm, how well does it do? Yeah. So it's kind of embarrassing that even given a fixed algorithm, how well does it do? This problem itself is unsolvable in some sense of the word. Um, so um, again, I, I could say more about the Grobin Dick problem. Well, yeah, BJ taught us. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Great. Um, so, OK, so this thing you can um, approximate it to pi over 2 um, with semi definite programming. Um, and it's NPR to do better than pi over two. Um, so you guys are all nodding, so let me assume we've done that. Um, so um, okay, so the STP relaxation of this. Um, so um, let's see. Okay, so if we call this whole thing matrix M, then uh, you know um, this thing is just uh, Max over um, positive semi definite V, V positive semi definite such that um, the uh, diagonal entries, J, J, that those one correspond to this thing um, of, uh, I don't know, V matrix dot product M. Yes? Um, so, so Paul, you need to plan to wrap up in now. It's a twelve thirty, so in five minutes. Or yep. So, yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Um, so now we want to use duality and turn it to minimization. Um. Yes. So let's see. Um, well, after I guess your your client uh, goes and looking for it, you are going to turn it to. Yeah, so I guess the point is that now, um, now, now this is a convex optimization problem. Um, so um, if we add the min over um, the choice of the uh, AIs here back into this, where again, M depends on the AIs here, um, then. Um, So it's um, so it, it's convex in the A's because this is um, a quadratic form, um, and it's linear in V because this is just V. Um, so we again have this convex concavity because it's con convex in one of the variables and linear in the other variable. Um, so this means that we can switch the order. Um, so this thing is just equal to um, x over the ESD with diagonal plus one over r plus the AI of um, this expression. Uh, sorry, this expression times. Okay. Um, so. The point I want to make is that we've actually made huge progress here. Um, so, um, the original min max problem was saying, look, we've got an algorithm here. The inner maximization was saying, find the essentially worst case data for this algorithm, which is NPR or, you know, it is, is daunting. Um, but if we switch these things, and it's now saying, look, V is essentially a proxy for our data. So it's saying, fix the data. What algorithm do you want? If I promise you I'm going to give you this data, and that's trivial. If I promise you what data I'm going to give, then there's no algorithmic problem there. But of course, there's a computation to figure out exactly what the right thing to do is. But if I prom promise you what data I'm going to give, then there's no, no problem left. Um, so 
the uh, interminimization now has just a completely closed form. It's just, um, you know, least square solution to matrix to linear equations. Um, and now this is some uh, positive semi-definite um, optimization over some um, convex expression involving you know, the solution to matrix equations. Um, so, um, yes, I'm sorry. Well, let me just write that out. Um, so, um, And also such that the what so what actually is the closed form of this optimum of this thing um, so it, it, um, there's something trivial but you know it ends up looking a little bit messy um, so it's um, pi transpose um, v minus um, v restricted to the rows si um sorry, this is sum over all um v restricted the rows si uh v restricted to both the rows si and the columns si inverse times v restricted to the rows si so, so, so this is some expression that you get from some linear solving some linear system. Um, I promise you this is actually convex in V. It doesn't look like it's convex in V, but it's actually convex in V. Like, you know, V occurs in some triple product, including an inverse, but it's actually convex, um, as sort of guaranteed by the minimax theorem. Um, so this whole thing is some uh, positive semi-definite optimization over something convex. And you can rephrase this as an entirely positive semi-definite problem if you want. Um, and Yeah. Um, so, so, so okay. Then this is the algorithm. Um, it's positive, positive semi-definite. If your complaint is that, well, this list of one through m is actually possible. It's an exponentially sized list of the entire distribution, entire description of the distribution. You can sample. We can prove that that works as well. So just take some polynomial number of samples and then use the empirical distribution instead of the true distribution. Solve the same positive semi-definite problem. So this is an algorithm, um, and just clarifying. Yeah. I mean, shouldn't the objective be concave for you to have an algorithm? Thank you. Uh, okay. Concave, yes. I mean, maybe I've got sign off somewhere, but yeah, yes. Um, we have code, this works like, yeah. Um, so um, um, from here, there's just open questions. So um, in some sense, the weird thing about this is that it's so opaque. So I started out with a few algorithms where there's some good intuition. So the important sampling thing, you um, count the underrepresented population five times so that it's you know, unbiased. The uh, predict in the future thing, you uh, predict that the next week is like the previous week. Um, this thing, who knows? Um, so you know, open questions are trying to get some kind of interpretation of this, trying to- yeah, uh, this, this thing has this property of uh... The cancellation where, where the cancellation on on when you have uh, when you have overlap. It behaves nice when you have overlap. Um so which cancellation are you talking about? If if you have a set where S I and T are where, or, where S and T, mm -hmm. a subset of S and T, uh, a joint subset. It doesn't care. I mean this is just a, yeah, it's for, it doesn't matter if they are this joint or not this joint. Yeah, that's exactly what it does. It also, I mean, there are examples where there are disjoint and you get something. I, I guess what you did say in, in, in does guarantee is being a constant fraction from the best possible. Uh, right, so, so, so because of the uh, um, Grothendieck pi over two constant, this is pi over two optimal among the class of semi-linear algorithms. Right. And, you know, when, when you take the uh, empirical sample, then it's, pi over two plus epsilon factor where the sample size depends polynomial on one over epsilon, yeah. Um, 
So you don't you don't know whether it's uh, yeah maybe yeah okay. So, yeah, so, 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 so you know the kind of open question we would have is like is there any you know easy to interpret way to figure out when this algorithm will say have sub constant um, uh, mean spread error. So um, you know, um, for example, um, can you predict given just some, some measure of say the overlap between S and T or some correlation matrix between S and T or self correlation matrix or whatever? Is there some way to, to you know, given that guarantee that um, there'll, there'll be a good algorithm? Um, so there's ton, tons of structure out here. Um, also, of course, predicting things other than the mean. The mean, of course, the proxy for lots of other things. Like if you want to do regressions, formula for linear regression just involves a ratio of means. So if you can estimate means well, you can also do, do a re regressions. But you know, there's tons of other things you can try and apply this to. But you know, so in general, we're trying to you know, say, look, lots of statistics has looked at um, assumptions about the distribution of uh, the, the data, but we're trying to instead scrutinize only the uh, sampling process and see what you can squeeze out of this. And of course, you know, some more hybrid approach might have the most fruit, but we're, we're just trying to open the door here. Okay, so right. that's it. Thanks. Yeah, thank you.